I'm going to talk today about the safe implementation of a well-formulated ketogenic diet in Australian type 2 diabetics. So I just want to uh, first of all explain uh, my qualifications and any conflicts of interest. That's really important when we're talking about research. So I'm a master's qualified nutritionist from Deakin University, uh, previous PhD candidate at University of Adelaide, a Bachelor of Management from Uni of SA, a Bachelor of Nursing from Flinders University. I have a private practice at Unley Park Specialist Centre, which is also a metabolic health clinic. And I'm not sponsored for this research, uh, nor am I being paid to give this talk. The little picture you can see down below was um, I'm a woman who has polycystic ovarian syndrome, and I also have endometriosis. Um, and I suffered greatly with my four pregnancies with gestational diabetes. So I was really struggling. I had been an athlete uh, for most of my life. Um, and around about the age of 24, um, despite all good intention, eating from the Australian Dietary Guidelines, I started to gain a lot of weight. I couldn't quite figure that out. No matter what the amount of exercise I did, I couldn't drop that weight. So it wasn't until a long time after that I figured out about insulin resistance. I almost gave my practice away and my husband said, no, don't do that. He said, you're an academic, you're smart, go figure it out, take a sabbatical. So that's exactly what I did. I delved into the literature and I kept searching for the answer and I found it. And then this is a picture of me afterwards. So the weight loss came eventually, but it took a long time. Okay, so the definitions I'm going to talk about today, because some of this is a bit, a bit tricky, um, and also just the aim of the study, what was, I, what was I looking for? So the definition, first of all, let's start with, so a well-formulated ketogenic diet has a high healthy fat and moderate protein content, somewhere between 20 to 50 grams per day of carbohydrate, um, promoting sustained nutritional ketosis. Y you've heard James talk uh, earlier this morning about people that would have somewhere in the order of 200 grams of carbohydrate a day. Typically when I take a patient history and we go through it for the very first time, people are stunned to understand they're having between 600 to 800 grams of carbohydrate in their diets daily. So what I'm taking them back to is 20 grams of carbohydrate a day. Okay, so nutritional ketosis is a metabolic state that occurs when the body predominantly uses ketone bodies. That's a type of molecule produced from fat as its primary source of energy instead of glucose. It's the body's primary source of energy in a state of glucose metabolism. So this reduction in carbohydrate intake reduces the availability of glucose in the body, which triggers a shift in metabolism to produce ketone bodies from stored fat as an alternative fuel source. And this can result in increased levels of ketone bodies in the blood, leading to this state of nutritional ketosis. It's quite safe. Babies that are breastfed in the first six months of life are in a state of nutritional ketosis. So this is not something that's foreign to us. We know that this is a safe state. It's just been misunderstood because what physicians have heard is they've heard the term diabetic ketoacidosis, and that's quite different. So this is a different state, so it just pays to understand this word. So the aim, uh, due to the utility of well-formulated ketogenic diets in the management of type 2 diabetes remaining controversial clinically, particularly in Australia, we aim to report on the safety, tolerability and the efficacy of these diets in individuals with type 2 diabetes under dietary management in an Australian clinical setting. Okay, so my methods. As a scientist, what I wanted to do is I uh, did a retrospective case study so looking at data from the past four or five years that was conducted on all patients with type 2 diabetes from our database referred to our specialist weight loss, clinic, weight loss clinic from November 2018 to April 2022. And I collected the following data. I looked at their height, their weight, their waist to hip ratio, their blood glucose levels, their blood ketone levels. This was all monitored and this data was collected. Patients were placed on a well-formulated ketogenic diet and once safely taken off certain diabetic drugs by their doctor, intermittent fasting, as James has mentioned before, was added. The compliance was assessed using an app to track food choices and all adverse effects were recorded. Patients were defined as nutritionally, nutritionally ketotic if their blood ketones were above 0.4. Remission of type 2 by diabetes was defined as a fasting blood glucose less than 7 and or a haemoglobin A1c 
And what that is, if you haven't heard that term, that's a blood test that measures the average blood glucose levels over a period of about two to three months. So an average or hemoglobin A1C less than 6.5 and cessation of all type 2 diabetes medication, with the exception of metformin, um, by their treating physician of more than three months. So the results. Um, so there were 61 deemed suitable for the diet who had at least two consultations with me over that study period. There were 31 males by chance and 30 females. We were just lucky. Uh, mean follow-up was about 130 days. Compliance was deemed good in 41 patients, variable in eight and poor in 12. Age ranges from about 30 to 79. Mean age was about 63, well, 64, 63. So that's just a diagrammatic representation. You can see um, the number of patients that I saw and it's um, divided down by age. So again, the majority of these pa patients uh, were over 50. Okay, so all these patients lost weight. Uh, the mean weight loss was uh, around about eight kilos. Almost 74% had significant improvement in their blood sugar levels. Just over 80% of these patients achieved nutritional ketosis. Um, almost 69% achieved fasting blood glucose levels less than seven consistently. Um, and their weight loss was strongly correlated to the number of follow-up visits. They were pretty happy with this, I must say. This was good. Weight loss, so that's just distribution of weight loss. You can have a look at that, that worked. And you've got someone right out there who lost an enormous amount of weight with me. Uh, okay, um, again, this is just a different diagram showing weight loss with number of consults. So the average number of consults for these patients to get these sort of results was about five consults. Uh, so this next slide <coughs> was really interesting. Um, we looked at the hemoglobin A1C readings and in 22 patients where the haemoglobin A1C readings were known, the mean reduction in this was 1.98. Um, in comparison, in clinical trials, um, they've shown that the drug Trulicity, you might have heard James mention this earlier, so we were talking about Ozempic, we were talking about these sorts of drugs, has been associated with the haemoglobin A1C reduction between 0.7 to 1.6% when used as a standalone therapy or in combination with other anti-diabetic medication. So what was interesting to me was what I was doing just with diet alone was actually working better than the drug Trulicity or Ozempic. Um, I went to uh, the United States and I presented this talk over there and also presented at the Australas Australasian Diabetes Congress and I was flabbergasted to see my little PhD paper up the back on a little tiny poster and this massive poster out the front with um, the drugs with Trulicity and I was standing there with my husband Jonathan I was like wow my diet's actually doing better so this was this was pretty good news. Okay so diabetes medication so there were 77 patients that were taking type 2 diabetes, diabetes medication at baseline 83% of them reduced or ceased medication with the exception of metformin including insulin changes there were 15 patients requiring insulin at baseline, and of these, nine ceased insulin and six continued at a much reduced dose. So overall, 26% met criteria for reversal of their diabetes. That's just a diagram there showing you the medication changes with the exception of metformin. So if you have a look at the ceased medication all around, you can see that they've had a pretty good result. We also now look at the changes in insulin dose. So even though there was a large percentage of these patients not taking insulin, for the ones that were, we had to be particularly careful and work very closely with their GP or their physician. Um, but by and large, uh, almost 10% reduced their insulin dose and almost 15% completely ceased this. This was fantastic news for these diabetics who'd been on lifelong insulin. This, is, this was good. These are our type 2 diabetics. Okay, so adverse effects. So there were no major adverse effects. Eight patients reported minor adverse effects such as constipation, dizziness, headache or nausea. All of these were reversed by adjustment with electrolyte intake or medication. Three patients had asymptomatic ketone readings of greater than five, but that was managed with medication adjustment by their treating doctor. And these patients were on a different class of drug called SGLT2s. 
um, a drug which increases the excretion of glucose in the urine, resulting in lower blood sugar levels. So we had to be careful with that. Um, later on this afternoon, um, one of my colleagues, uh, Nicole, will talk more about um, foods. But this is just an example to show you what am I talking about on these sorts of food? Is it so terribly restrictive that it's unpleasant? And it's really not. We've, we've got, you know, fantastic fluffy omelette here and we've got muffins and we've got, you know, a goat's cheese and leek pie. We've got um, a hamburger with avocado buns. We've got lots of veg. We've got beautiful meats that are grass-fed, grass-finished, all sorts of things, a tandoori chicken dish. So it's not as restrictive as what people think. In conclusion, so with specialist nutritional and medical support, a well-formulated ketogenic diet is a safe and powerful tool to achieve weight loss and improve type 2 diabetic control in motivated patients. But what we need is more long-term studies to determine the sustainability of improved healthcare outcomes and the effect of type 2 diabetes-related complications. A little bit like what James was talking about earlier. My PhD had involved looking at type 2 diabetics and these, these eye diseases that they get and, and the effect of a low-carbohydrate diet on that. So we need more of these sorts of studies. And I think that in response to the person that asked, you know, how do we begin to feel safe about this as clinicians? by having this research out there. If we've got that out there, um, then it makes um, the likes of doctors and nutritionists and so forth feel a lot safer about what we're doing. So the research becomes an important factor. And that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs>